few pictures of my family. Uh, in fact, I have very few. And I believe this one is a picture of uh, my family when I was about uh, eight or nine years old. It comes from the mid-1950s, taken in, I believe, Saskatoon, and it's Christmas. And this is my mother, Eva Muriel McNabb was her maiden name. She was a Cree woman from the Gordon First Nation. My brother Winston, myself, and my dad. My dad's name was Kwan Lin Yok. He came from Sai Sing Lei, Canton, China, Guangdong. His nickname was Happy. And as you can probably tell from the photograph, he was quite a bit older than my mother, about 20, 21, 22 years older. And uh, that probably created some stress in their lives. But uh, so we're. Winston and I are, are mixed heritage. I was born in North Battleford. And at the time, my dad was doing really well. He owned two cafes. One was called the Victory Cafe, because uh, that was after the post, post sorry, the, after the Second World War. And I do have one picture of me sitting in a cafe. This would be in Killam, Alberta. It's a small town in Alberta. So we moved around a lot from small towns in Saskatchewan to small towns in Alberta. And uh, my brother and I both had to work in the cafe, doing all the jobs, filling the salt and pepper shakers, you know, filling up the napkin dispensers. My mother died, this is a picture of her uh, tombstone, it's just a flat concrete slab into the ground. She died in 1956, she was only 36 years old. She's buried in Killam, Alberta. And I have been told to go back to visit her grave, which I started doing once I started reconciling my, you know, my own inner spirit. I went back to visit her grave and tell her, you know, how things are going for me and, and my family. So she was she was buried there, and um, one of her relatives came to the uh, funeral. And they took away all her things, and I thought, I couldn't understand why. But I guess that was the First Nation Cree thing, was to clear out all her things so that the grieving would be shorter. And I never really understood that until I went back to uh, visit my family uh, on that my mother's side. But uh, while I was in grade 12, my, my father died. And we were very poor, but you can tell by this photo, it's a beautiful uh, tombstone erected on his uh, grave and that was provided by the Chinese community and my guess would be that it was uh, like a Chinese ben benevolent association in Swift Current and there was actually I remember uh, a house uh, not just off railway street where the Chinese men would hang out and if I wanted to find my dad and I didn't know where he was that's where he was and there they would read the Chinese newspapers, they would, you know, drink the horrible Chinese whiskey, oof, and, uh, you know, talk about what was going on at home. So that's how they, and that was their, their main social outlet. In 1981, I got my PhD in biological psychiatry. This is, my son was uh, seven at the time. So 1981, I became Dr. Lillian Dick. And in 1981, I finally said, it's time for me to come out of the closet. And I said, I am now going to tell the world I'm also Cree. I'm an Indian person. I'm not just Chinese. Because when my mother died, she said, don't tell anybody you're Chinese. Uh, sorry, don't tell anybody you're Indian because life will be too difficult. Just pretend you're just Chinese. So that's what we did just Chinese. However, though we faced racism as kids growing up as Chinese, it wasn't as bad if they had known we were also Indian, because there was more discrimination against Indians than there was against Chinese. Now the really wonderful part was, uh, was when I became a senator in 2005, I made it part of my mission to, uh, to look after the Chinese and First Nation files. I had done that anyway 
in, in my other work as a, as a professor and speaker in the community. And uh, a friend of mine from Victoria, Lily Chow, has very good connections with the, uh, uh, the Guangdong uh, Chinese Overseas Association. And when they found out that a descendant of one of the uh, first wave of Chinese to, to leave uh, Canton had become a Canadian senator, they were just thrilled. And so they invited me over to visit and said they would take us to my dad's village. And I had to perform other sort of official functions, but it was such a thrill because I, I had thought dad's village would be, would be long gone. You know, when I saw this, you know, we all assume villages like here in Canada, 100 years later, no more, ghost town. But they did take us back. And uh, this is a picture from November 2009 of my dad's village. And uh, it was thrilling. And I knew it was his village because the top characters match the characters on his tombstone. So I looked, I took a copy of the picture with me. I held it up and I thought, yes, same characters. So we are in the right place. They greeted us with a lion dance. Uh, they took us to his house. And uh, they did a prayer ceremony, Buddha's prayer. That was probably the most touching because at that point, it touches your whole being. And so we went with the, the incense sticks to the, to the, to the family uh, altar in the different areas in the house. And they had my son and myself do the prayers with the, the paper money and whatnot. And somehow that just solidified it for me and for my son. It was so touching. You know, the, 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 the time, because it'll be 100 years ago next year that my dad arrived in Canada. 100 years ago, 1912 to 2012. And one of the things they, they did, uh, the village people were so welcoming. They gave me a handful of soil, I put it in my luggage, and they said, for his spirit to rest, that soil should be taken back and put on his grave. So when we got back that fall, we, uh, the, my brother, my son, and myself went back to Daddy's tombstone, and we sprinkled the soil all around it, so that he was reunited with his village, and that he could rest in peace, and that his spirit would feel happy. I always thought my mother, because that message not to tell anybody you were Indian, I thought she used marriage as a strategy to get away from all the, you know, the horrors that happened to her when she was in residential school to get away from the reserve because there was a lot of uh, abuse, sexual abuse and drug abuse occurring on reserves at that point in history. And at that point in history, I'm not sure whether there was still the pass system on reserves in the 1940s where you could not leave a reserve without a pass from the Indian agent. That probably didn't change until 1950s. You couldn't even go to university. You couldn't go past grade six or grade eight was the only education she, you could get. Plus, maybe there's a funnier side too. Plus, you know, they're young women. They're tall, they're fair skinned, they're beautiful. And, you know, they're related to everybody on the reserve. So they've got to go somewhere to find a husband. And who's going to marry them? In the small little village, there might be uh, some Caucasian guy that's attracted to them. But it's probably more likely that uh, someone who's also not white will want to marry them. And so we have the Chinese men that are here as so-called bachelors. And also they're businessmen. They have a future. So I think, well, maybe my mom, I'm just guessing, you know, she's planning for her future. And she's saying, you know, here's this guy, he's running a cafe, uh, looks like a pretty good prospect, <laughs> not bad looking, uh, maybe we could get together. <laughs> Interesting. 
Yeah, and she, uh, of the few pictures I have of her, there was one other of us sitting on a hill, and what I remember is she was always very elegant. She was tall and she wore, she had a fox stole that was quite popular then, so it's like the whole fox, eyes, nose, you know, feet, and the, the fox's mouth was, was clamped onto the tail, and this she wore around her shoulders. And when she stood, she always had kind of that little hand out. She was a smoker, quite elegant, elegant smoker, and with her hand up like this, one glove on and one glove off. And I always thought she looked so elegant. Uh, so I think for her generation too, once they got off the reserve for her and her sisters, because they were quite tall, fair skinned, people thought of them as being exotic, right? And who is this lady? You know, what is what is her nationality? What's she like? And I got a little bit of that too when I grew up. As I got older, people would say, "Well, what is she? You know, she's kind of exotic looking. Where is she from? Is she from Brazil?" <laughs> and when my hair, one time when I got a perm, it was way way too tight, so it was really really curly. And so people then would think I was from South America. I was some strange uh, South American exotic person. <laughs> In BC here, I'm so happy to, to hear that these stories are coming out because I always thought there must be many more in BC because that's where the Chinese landed, Victoria, Vancouver, the population so much bigger. And then I met Larry Grant and I thought, oh, he's my first one from BC, how oh, exciting. So the history is starting to be unveiled and we're starting to understand what contributions that can Chinese Canadians and First Nations have made to our country as a whole.